showdown must take place. Darius chooses the location, camping his forces at the River Bomelos, near the village of Gagumela. None of Alexander's battles is better documented by ancient historians than the Battle of Gagumela. Darius assembled his forces and made everything ready for battle. He had fashioned swords and lances much longer than his earlier types. He had also constructed 200 scythe-bearing chariots, well designed to astonish and terrify the enemy. From each of these were projected out beyond the trace horses, scythes nearly a meter in length, presenting their cutting edges to the front. The night before the battle, several miles of rolling hills separate the two armies. Alexander's chief general Parmenio and several of his most prominent officers move forward to survey the enemy position. They were filled with amazement at the sight and remarked to one another that it would have been a very difficult task to defeat an enemy of such strength by engaging him by day. They therefore went to Alexander to persuade him to attack by night so as to conceal from his men the most terrifying element in the coming struggle. That is the odds against them. It was then that Alexander gave him his celebrated answer. I will not steal my victory. He was determined that if Darius were defeated, he should have no cause to summon up courage for another attempt. He was not to be allowed to blame darkness and night for his failure on this occasion. As at Issus, he had blamed the narrow mountain passes and the sea. And there is this account of how he sat there at night into the darkness, figuring out strategy and tactics, finally got what he wanted, and this is the point, then just fell into a totally undisturbed sleep. And he slept on. And he said, till I got it figured out, I was worried. After that, I was fine. The army got up in the morning. The valley was sounded. Alexander slept on like a baby until finally his staff officers had to wake him. At this point, Alexander gives his troops the pet talk of their lives, confidently telling them that this battle would decide who would rule the continent of Asia. On the other side of the battlefield, the Persian king Darius is giving a speech of his own. But his mood is more of desperation than of confidence. He tells his troops, today will consolidate or terminate an empire greater than any age has seen. Now, it is not glory for which you must fight, it is survival. Our backs are to the wall. I beg you by our country's gods, deliver the Persian people and its honor from the depths of disgrace. Slowly but methodically, Alexander's phalanx marches forward in formation to encounter Darius's new rolling weapons. The scythe chariot swung into action at full gallop and created great alarm and terror among the Macedonians. As the phalanx joined shields, however, all beat upon their shields with their spears as the king had commanded, and a great din arose. In some instances, the horses were killed by javelin casts, and in others, they rode through and escaped. But some of them, using the full force of their momentum, and applying their steel blades actively wrought death among the Macedonians in many and various forms. They severed the arms of many, shields and all, and in no small number of cases, cut through necks and sent heads tumbling to the ground with the eyes still open and the expression of the countenance unchanged. And in other cases, they sliced through ribs with mortal gashes and inflicted a quick death. Facing a king and his army, fighting with superhuman strength and passion to retain control of Asia, Alexander's soldiers find themselves, for the first time, struggling not to win, 
but simply to survive. The situation looks horribly bleak for the Macedonian General Parmenio, who heroically attempts to maintain order in a valiant struggle with his infantry. He realizes there is only one person who has the capacity to turn the tide of battle, Alexander himself. But Alexander is preoccupied, personally fighting his way toward the chariot bearing King Darius. Alexander has sighted his adversary through the ranks of cavalry, who were closely massed to guard the lofty chariot in which he stood. The bravest stood fast and were slaughtered in front of their king. They fell upon one another in heaps. As for Darius, all the horrors of the battle were now before his eyes. It had become difficult to turn his chariot around and drive it away, since the wheels were encumbered and entangled with bodies. The king abandoned his chariot and his armor, mounted a mare and rode away. It is believed that he would not have escaped at the moment had not Parmenio sent another party of horsemen, begging Alexander to come to his rescue. When this news was brought to Alexander, he turned back again from further pursuit, and wheeling round with the companion cavalry, led them with great speed against the right wing of Darius' horsemen. Then ensued the most obstinately contested cavalry fight in the whole engagement. Here about 60 of Alexander's companions fell, but Darius' troops were overcome by Alexander, and as many of them as could force their way through his ranks fled with all their might. What may have first appeared to be impending doom for Alexander proves to be yet another episode confirming Alexander's genius as a commander. Realizing that Darius is relying not on his infantry, but massed squadrons of heavily armed horsemen, Alexander tempts both of Darius's cavalry wings to charge his echelon flanks. Alexander hopes that the flanks can hold out just long enough to create a gap in the Persian line, allowing Alexander's companion cavalry to punch through, which they do with perfect timing. Historians past and present Consider the strategy masterful. Alexander had a tactical brilliance there. The only thing that one can perhaps criticise is that he left the battlefield in pursuit of Darius, trying to get hold of him alive. Alexander wheels around and starts off in pursuit of Darius once more, keeping up the chase as long as there is daylight. Parmenio's brigade also follows, but when darkness falls, Alexander stops to rest his men and horses. Darius continues to ride away, leaving behind his chariot, spear and bow. Again, Darius escapes. Although the Macedonian army is grossly outnumbered, the casualty figures reported by historians are nothing short of astounding. Some say incredible. Of Alexander's men, about 100 were killed, and more than 1,000 of his horses were lost, either from wounds or from fatigue in the pursuit. Of Darius's forces, there were said to have been 300,000 slain, and far more were taken prisoner than were killed. The Battle of Gagamela leaves no doubt that Persia is now under Alexander's control. But of far greater importance for the warrior king is the capture of King Darius. Alexander knows Darius will be far more valuable governing Persia under his command than as a deceased ruler. But would he be able to capture the fallen king alive? Alexander's victory at the Battle of Gagamela is viewed by many as the most significant triumph in his conquest of Asia. After the battle had ended in this way, the authority of the Persian Empire was regarded as having been completely overthrown. Alexander was proclaimed King of Asia, and after offering splendid sacrifices,